let's give our Facebook audience a round of applause, those of you joining us today. Also, those of you joining us by way of YouTube, we're so glad you're here today. We believe God's going to minister to you just like he is everyone here in the house this morning. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your precious, holy written word. As we look to your word today, I trust the Holy Spirit to give me utterance and unction. May you think through my mind and speak through my mouth and bring revelation through my spirit. I declare over every one of you within the sound of my voice that you are good ground, that you hear the word and receive it and bear fruit. Some 30, 60, and finally 100-fold in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I say that every, almost every week that I declare you're a good ground, that you hear the word and receive it and bear fruit 30, 60, and finally 100-fold. Because how many of you understand today that the word of God, you can receive uh, uh, 30-fold, and then as you can keep trusting God, 60-fold, and finally 100-fold, the fullness thereof, right? And so please continue to feed it. Thank you for coming to church every week. I believe you are working to 30, 60, finally to the 100-fold, where the fullness of all that God has provided through Jesus belongs to us, right? <laughs> And so it's by progression, so stay with it. I said, stay with it, right? Somebody says, well, I'm believing for healing. I'm only, you know, I, I just, I, I'm mostly still sick. Well, maybe you're at that 30-fold level where you feel 30-fold better, but still 70's not so good. That's not the time to cast away your faith, right? You keep trusting God, and you'll get to that 60-fold and eventually 100-fold every area of your life. Amen. So we've been talking about the life of faith today, uh, this past few weeks, and the life of faith is a beautiful life. Can I just tell you that? I mean, if you've not had an opportunity to live by faith, you've missed a lot. Because the ability to trust God is such a unique quality that we as Christians have. And when we are standing in faith, we are trusting God. That usually means that not everything is just exactly right to the hundredfold, if you will. You understand, why do you need faith if everything's perfect? Faith said everything's not perfect, but I believe in God and his word. That he's working powerfully in my life, bringing every Bible promise to pass in my life. So the life of faith doesn't mean everything's great. It means I am trusting God, and I am believing God, and I am living a life of faith to shine for Jesus, even though I have tests and trials, right? So it's, it's a beautiful life, and those of us that have been living by faith all these years, we can got testimony after testimony of God's good. How about you, right? And so I want to talk, the title of my message today is Two Kinds of Faith. Everybody say that with me. Two <laughs> Kinds of Faith of faith. And, you know, when we were born, and everyone born into this world from their mama's womb, they all have the first kind of faith that I'm talking about, natural human faith. Everyone has that as soon as you're born. Natural human faith says, if I can see it, I'll believe it. If I can touch it, I'll believe it. But if I can't see it, if I can't feel it, if I can't touch it, if it's not in the five, full, five sense realm, then I don't believe it. But I believe it if I can see it. And if I can touch it and feel it, then yeah, I'm a person of faith. Well, everybody has, that's a natural human kind of faith. And then there's the second kind of faith, that is the God kind of faith, or the Bible kind of faith that says, I don't have to see it or feel it. It does not have to be in the sense realm for me to believe it. That's the God kind of faith, and we're going to talk about that today. You know, um, uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead, and he first appeared to his disciples in his resurrected form, and he walked into the room where the disciples were and said, Peace be unto you. They were all astonished. They saw Jesus walk in, and, and he appeared to them. Um, but the first time he appeared to them, there was one disciple who was not there. What's his name? Thomas. He was not there. And when Thomas showed up 
And his, the, the rest of the disciples say, oh, man, Tom, you just missed out on something awesome. What? Jesus was just here. He showed up. He's alive. We all saw him. We touched him. And we touched all of his wounds in the print. And Tom, it's good news. And Th Thomas said what? He said, mm-mm, sorry, guys. And I, can't, I cannot buy into it. No. He said, unless. In fact, do we have that scripture, Roxanne? Put that scripture here. Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, the scripture says. Drop down. The other disciples said, we have seen the Lord. And he said, what? Unless I see his hand. Notice, see sight, one of the five senses. And put the print of the nail and put my finger into the print of the nail. Touch. Right? And my hand into his side. Notice he said, I will. What? I will not believe. Natural human faith. Everybody has that. He says, I will not believe. I mean, his good friends testifying. Dude, Tom, come on. We're talking about Jesus, our Lord. Our, our, so we look to him. He's risen. I cannot believe it. Wow. Drop down. Goes on to say, and after eight days, his disciples were together. And Jesus came again. Inside, and Thomas was with them, and the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst, and Jesus said, Peace be to you. And then he said to Thomas, How many of you know Jesus still loved Thomas? People sometimes struggle with doubt. He doesn't cast you off. How dare you not believe him, huh? He's so gracious, so kind. I mean, he could have said, Thomas, are you kidding me? All three years? Miracles, all kind of healings, all kind, and, and, you, and you don't believe, I'm done with you. No. He said, come here, Thomas, let me, let me help you. Let me encourage you. Thomas, reach your hand, your, your hand and your finger and look at my hands and touch my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. Made a believer out of him, Right? But Jesus said something powerful after that. He said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've touched me, you've, you've been right here with me, you put your hands here, because you've seen me with natural human faith, you believe. But he said, blessed are those, what? Who have not seen and yet believe. How many believers do we have in the house today? Hey, <laughs> don't tell me you don't have faith. Don't tell me you don't have the ability to believe God. As I've said in this study, you, the measure of the God kind of faith has been imparted into your spirit when you got saved. That gift is in you. You have a believer on the inside of you that be, believes God. You have a truster on the inside of you that knows how to trust God. You're in the family of God. Right? And so Jesus said, you, you, you believe because you've seen me. But there's coming a whole, come on, a whole group of folks. The church is coming, and they are blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen but yet believe. I declare you are blessed today. <laughs> Amen. I've never seen Jesus. I've never touched his side. But I tell you what, I believe in him more than, a, than I believe that pulpit's right there right now. How about you? You got a powerful believer in you, and God, Jesus said, you are blessed today. Just look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed today. I, I, am, I am blessed. I am a believer. So please, I had so many Christians who are like, oh, I know exercising faith, woe is me. I'm just, I'm kind of the ones Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. Even the faith of a mustard seed can blow up a mountain, Jesus said. Even if you feel like you're the least and you just got a little bit of something in you. That little bit of something is enough to move God on your behalf. For every Bible promise to come to pass. We are people of faith. We are a faith people of a faith God. Not the Thomas kind of faith. Not natural kind of faith that has to see to believe. We have the faith of God. It says, I don't care if I never see this or, or into this natural realm. I believe God and his word. And what Jesus has promised. I know we go through some stuff sometimes and we feel the pressure 
husbands and wives and they feel this. Maybe it's a financial thing or healing, whatever, restoration of a loved one. And it's easy to get discouraged. We understand that. And Jesus understands it. Obviously, he worked with Thomas. But when times like that happen, you know, we just need to look to each other and say, honey, I know we're going through this, but why don't we just act like the Bible's true? What do you say? Why don't we just, why don't we just say we're going to believe what God said regardless of what's out here? What do you say, babe? Yes. We are people of God. We are people of faith, right? Hebrews chapter 1, very powerful. You know, when I was a young Christian, I, I would read this scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 1, and it totally baffled me when I was a young Christian. I would read it. So, now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I would go, I have, I have no idea what that means, but I know it's something good. It's got to be something good. And, and, and Lord, help me, to, help me to understand that. And then I went on to read in verse 3 of Hebrews, same chapter, by faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, this natural world, were not made by things which are visible. And so God is so kind and gracious. He is God is a faith God. And God created, somebody said, God created the world from nothing. Well, actually, that's not true. He created the world with the substance of faith. I have something written down here. I want, I, want to, I want to read it to you. Bible faith, the God kind of faith, is a heavenly or spiritual substance or reality that cannot be touched physically. Faith is, does have substance, but it's in the realm of the spirit. It's a heavenly reality. Uh, it has substance to it, a materiality, if you will. Faith is not just something. Faith is real, and it's powerful, and it's in the realm of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So Bible hope, by the way, is a good thing. Not, not just natural hope, but Bible hope. Natural hope says, well, I hope something good happens. Well, God, you know, no. Bible hope has a good expectation of things to come. Bible hope looks to the future. That's why the scripture says we have the hope of heaven. In other words, we know that one day we will be there in the future. So hope, if you will, Bible hope sets a goal or sets a target and faith brings that, what you hope for, by the substance of faith, brings it into the, the reality realm. Faith is the substance, the, the, the power, if you will, to bring into your world what you hope for. It is the evidence of what you cannot see. Somebody said, you don't look healed to me. How dare you say you're the healed of God? How dare you say God takes care of your needs? Look at you. I know you got financial problems. But you're not looking at this room. You say, how do you know you're healed? My faith is the evidence in what God has said. Faith is the proof, one translation says, of that which you cannot see. And so the realm of God... The realm of the spirit, the word of God, and all that Jesus has done is greater than this natural realm, dare I say, more real. Can I say it that way? Because the realm of God, by faith, created the universe. The, the, the realm of the spirit created this natural realm, so the realm of the spirit's got to be greater and more powerful. So faith is a substance of things hoped for, the, Hope sets the target. I believe I, I, I'm, I'm going to trust God. Faith says I have it now. Faith is the power of God. You know, we're, we're uh, here today, and we enjoy the air. How many of you are thankful for air conditioning in your house and in the house of God? We have five powerful units on this building. 
By the way, I just want to give God praise because this whole building and everything in it is debt-free. I just want to give the Lord praise for that right now. Thank you, Lord. You're so faithful. You've taken care of us. But there's five powerful units, two that cool the sanctuary, one that cool praise central over here where the little ones are. There's one that cools kid zone and the a multi-purpose room, and there's one that cools all the office space over here in the, in the bathroom. Five units, and so there's five thermostats, two right behind the guys in the booth right there, and then five throughout the building. Now, the thermostat, how many of you understand that that thermostat, you turn it on, you set the thermostat for how cool you want it. We all know that, right? The thermostat, but you understand today, when you set that thermostat, unless there's a power unit, nothing's going to happen. Right? I don't care how many thermostats you get, unless there's a power unit connected to that thermostat, it, it will not cool the place. So the thermostat sets the goal. It's like hope. It, it sets the target. I want it to be 72 in here today. You set that. It sends a message to the unit, and the unit, the compressor, where the power is, kicks in and cools off the room. So in the same way, your hope sets the target, but your faith brings it into reality with the power of God. Faith in the word of God. Faith, not faith in faith. It's faith in Jesus and in the finished work, the power of the cross and the promises of God. Faith is important, but we don't put faith in faith. We look to God. When you look to God and his word and the finished work of Christ and the love and the grace of God, faith will rise up inside of you. And it will be there. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the God kind of faith does not have to see, feel, touch to believe. The God's kind of faith says, I believe it before it happens. Amen. You know, when God approached Abram, who later became Abraham, but before his name was changed, his name was Abram. And God approached Abram one day and said, Abram, listen, I want to make a covenant with you. I want to make a deal with you. I want to make a great nation from your descendants, your seed, from your son. And in fact, I want to create a nation. I'm going to name it Israel, and through that seed is going to come the Messiah to be the Savior, not only of Israel, but the entire world. And you and your wife, from your son, we're gonna, it's going to be a great nation. Abram says, Lord, we got a problem. What? Thank you for that offer, but the problem is I'm old. My beautiful, lovely wife, Sarai, whom I love, we've been trying to have kids for decades. She's barren. She's not been able to have any children. And now she's past childbearing years. I'm old. I don't even know if I can do anything. <laughs> and, and so I, I, we got a problem. How about if I just, you know, works another plan up and God said, no, 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 stop that. From your own body, you and your wife shall have a son. And from him. The nation of Israel will be born, and other nations as well. And did you know that Abram struggled with that because he didn't know much about the God kind of faith. He thought you had to see, touch, feel, and everything for it to happen. So God told him one day, he says, Abram, step out. It was evening time, nighttime. Step outside of your, your, your dwelling. Look up at the night sky. You see the beautiful universe. You see all the stars there. Start counting them. Abram's one, two, three, four, five. Six. Did I count that one? Oh, seven, six, seven, six. Finally, Lord, it's too many. I can't count them. He says, so shall your descendants be. 
so shall be the seed from your own body. And he said, go to the seashore. So he went to the seashore, see all the sand, start counting them. One, two, Lord, it's too many. So shall your seed be. So Abraham had two descendants, natural descendants, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, whom God loves, by the way, and whom God is still going to see that all is taken care of with them. Even though Israel in general has rejected their Messiah, God has not rejected the Jewish people, nor will he ever. May we always bless them as a nation and as a people. But you had his natural descendants by, as the sand of the seashore, and then the spiritual descendants as the stars in the sky. So that every one of us that are in Christ, people of faith, we are Abraham's descendants, people of faith, as the stars in the sky. Too numerable, you can't count. And so God helped Abram. And God said, here's what I'm going to do, Abram. I'm going to change your name to, from Abram to Abraham. And from Sarai to Sarah. And if you know anything about the Hebrew language, you know that when the he, the ha in Abraham is the Greek, is the Hebrew language for he, meaning grace. God said Abraham, and he breathed grace, and Sarah, grace. From now on, you call each other Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham means I have made you the father of many nations. Sarah, the prince, or the prince of, of, of many nations. So now when they said, hey, Abraham, come on in, it's time to eat, or Abraham this, or Abraham that. He is saying, hey, father of many nations, Sarah, Sarah, princess of many nations, before their son was even conceived. We're talking about the God kind of faith today. Notice Romans chapter 4. We looked at this, I think, last week, but it's worthy of, again, as it is written, God says, I have present tense or past tense. I have made you a father of many nations, not I'm going to one day. God said to this to Abraham before they were even conceived a son. The God kind of faith declares what is before it comes into realm. That's why many times I, I tell some of you, you're trusting God for provision. Just tell God, thank you, my needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I don't care if it's in the middle of lack. Every need is met in Jesus' name. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I don't care what it looks like. My declaration, healing is mine. I have it now. That's the way that God finds the faith works. I have made you, Father, many in the presence of whom he believed God who gives life to the dead. Which, remember, Abraham and Sarah, their bodies are as good as dead. They had no, no chance to have kids. They're past the years. But God quickens the dead. Gives life to things that are dead or dying. How many of you know he can quicken your bodies as well? He can quicken your marriage. He can quicken a relationship that seems like it might be dead. He gives life to it. Right? And calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So the God kind of faith calls the things that do not exist as though they did. And that's why I've said many times throughout the years, as the patriarch of my family, I declare in my seat of authority in the spirit, all my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren shall serve the Lord throughout many generations in Jesus' name. Somebody says there are a few of them look like they've gone haywire. What of it? This is my declaration. I'm holding fast to it. I don't go by the realm that I see. I go by the realm of the spirit, which is a greater realm. You call things that do not exist as though they did. This is the God kind of faith. that you, It doesn't make sense to the world. How dare you say that you're righteous? I know what you've done. I know the sins of your past and the life that you've lived and all the stuff. You're saying you're saved. You're saying your sins are forgiven. You're saying you have right standing with God. Yes, because of what Jesus did. I, my sins of my entire life have been forgiven. He bore the sins of my entire life before I was even born. Hey! <laughs> and the blood avails for every one of them. 
And God says, you are righteous, you have right standing with me, you have favor with me continually. That's why even if I mess up, I lose my temper, whatever happens, I say, thank you, Lord, my sins are forgiven. Thank you, I have, I am righteous by faith. Thank you, I am forever in your favor and in your grace, and I give you praise for it. That's going to propel you to live, go forward. Instead of wallowing in the past and shame and going back to the world and back to sin, it will propel you to live a life that glorifies God. To call things that be not as though they were, as though they did exist. And yes, Lord, so we know that we are forgiven, we are healed, we are blessed, we are provided for, we are righteous, we are forgiven, all because of the cross of Christ. Drop down quickly, verse 18, we're still talking about Abraham and Sarah, Sarah who contrary to hope, they had no hope for a son naturally speaking, but against hope, they what? Believed and that he became the father of many nations. Just as it was spoken, so shall your seed or your descendants shall be. So even if it looks hopeless, our God is greater, is he not? With God, nothing is hopeless. No person is too far gone. No miracle is beyond out of reach. Because God specializes when there's hopelessness, when there's a mess, where things don't look good. That's where he shines the most. He needs somebody to say the yes and amen. Drop down, verse 19. goes on to say, Abraham and Sarah, and be not weak in faith. He did not consider, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead. He was about 100 years old nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. She's about 90. No chance, naturally speaking, to have it. He did not consider that what was in the natural. He only considered the promise, I have made you the father of many nations. From your body shall come forth a son. And he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, what? Giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Praise God. And if you know the story, you know after a number of years, they were able to conceive, and Sarah had a son, and his name was what? Isaac, meaning laughter. God turned their sorrow into joy or laughter. Right? And from Isaac came Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, and the genealogy of Jesus came right down through that line, the nation of Israel, right on down until, until uh, Jesus was born and the Messiah came. Praise God. How many of you are glad they stayed in faith? <laughs> right? Now, they didn't do it. Can I tell you something? When you read the account in Genesis, Abraham and Sarah did not do everything right. Need I go there? <laughs> Sarah's like, Abe, this is taking way too long. We, we got a problem. Honey, God said that, that from our body is going to come that son. It's, let's just keep trusting God. I got an idea, she said. This is taking way too long. You know our maid, Hagar? Mm -hmm. I got an idea. Why don't you sleep with her? She'll get pregnant. When she has the baby, I'll be right there to get the baby, and we can say, this baby will be our seed. Abraham says, whatever you say, honey. <laughs> you know best. <laughs> so we all know how that went. That turned out bad, because as soon as the baby was born from Hagar, Sarai despised it, and she, it was not the, the, the baby from the promised seed. And God says, uh-uh, the seed shall come from your own body. By the way, that caused a lot of problems down the line. I don't have time to get into all that. But my point is, sometimes we don't do everything right. Is God going to cast us off and say you're disqualified? Did God disqualify Abraham and Sarah after they made that mistake? No. Thank God for his grace, amen, and his love and forgiveness. And you might have made some mistakes, and it seems like you're off course. But well, as soon as you say, Lord, I thank you for your, I didn't do everything right. Thank you for the blood. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. 
Thank you, Lord, that you forgive me according to the riches of your grace. And God will get you right back on course, and you just jump right back into faith. Being fully persuaded. So when you get to Romans, Romans mentions nothing about their mistakes. We just read it. They're strong in faith, giving glory to God, fully persuaded what God promised he was able to do, and, and that the, the, they considered not their own body. They sound like faith giants. Do they not? Why? Because when you come through the cross, when you come through the power of God and through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible does not record your failures and your mess up. It only records your acts of faith. Mm. please understand that when you come to the book of Hebrews all the men and women of faith and all of them messed up all of them made mistakes like we do did you know that not one sin not one mistake is recorded in, in Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith chapter all it records is their deeds of faith or when you and I come through the cross as we do now, though we fail and mistake, God says they're forgiven, they're forgiven. All I see is your faith in God. Praise God. Your faith looks like a giant to God. Not your mistakes. They're all washed like Abraham and Sarah and all the other patriarchs of old. And God only records your acts of faith. All your sins and lawless deeds have been forever forgotten. Heaven does not record the sins of the believer. Otherwise, it will record their mistakes. But no. Yes, it's recorded in the Old Testament, but coming through the blood, the cross, now they're not there. Because the blood of Jesus is more powerful than the blood of bulls and goats. Come on, somebody help me today. Hey! <laughs> Woo, I'm preaching good right now. Mm. Thank God for the blood that cleanses and washes and makes us new. You know, my mother-in-law here on the front row, God bless all our mother-in-laws. We love them, do we not? Well, <clears throat> she just had a birthday just this past week. Can I tell how old you are? No, never mind. Okay, let me just say this. Is what I was going to tell you, but 12 years ago when she turned 70, I'll say it like that, all right? <laughs> 12 years ago, when she turned 70, she had a dream in her heart. She wanted to, since you've been a little girl, I think, to, to skydive, jump out of a plane with a parachute. So 12 years ago, on her 70th birthday, I said, Ma, if, if you want to do it, I'll go with you. She said, I want to do it. We, can't, we went down here to the Lincoln Airport, signed up to jump. And so you're assigned, because we're first-time jumpers, you obviously are assigned uh, someone who's experienced, and you're, you harness together with, they're in a harness, and you're in a harness in front of them. And so we met the person who each of us was, we were going to jump with, and, the, and they had their parachute unfolded there. They'd already done a jump. And so we watched as they folded up their parachute for the ones that we were going to use. And then they gave us instructions. And they said, hey, listen, when we jump out of the plane, this is very important. They said, when you jump into the plane, don't tuck into, uh, you, you know, tuck into a roll, because if you do, we might roll. <sighs> no good. So they said, when you jump out of the plane, put your body into a backward C as much as you can. This way. And that'll keep us from rolling. I'm thinking, do I want to do that? <laughs> it's like... But actually, we felt peace about it, Ma. We felt good about it. So all the local news was there, a 70-year-old grandma getting ready to parachute. The local, all, the, all the stations were there. So we went up. It was, I don't know, August. I think it was an August day. We went up in the plane over 10,000 feet. The door opened. We're both harnessed to our, our partner. You ready for this? We're ready. We felt good. We jumped. It was a beautiful jump, was it not, Ma? And just free fall, saw for miles. By the way, you can, from God's perspective, everything on the earth looks small. Just a little nugget there. But I, but, but I went into the backward sea, 
and, and so did Ma, and everything went good. And we went down so far, just free falling, seeing everything beautiful. We got near to the ground, the rip cord pulled, the parachute came out. And I, as I was landing, coming into the landing zone, I, I followed everything he said. He said, do this, do that. And when I got ready to land, he said, lift up your feet, lift up both feet high. And I lift him up and just scooted on a rear, just right on a beautiful landing, had a beautiful time. The news was there. We, got, we saw all that. But can I tell you something? We put our entire life into the hands of someone we just met, didn't know from Adam, and we trusted his instructions and we trusted his parachute that he was packing. We trusted our whole life with this guy. And afterwards, I'm thinking, what have I done? This guy, I don't even know him. He could have suicidal thoughts and say, this is the one time I'm going down and sorry you happen to be with me. I mean, who, anything could have happened. But my entire life, I put it in his hands and you too, Mom. But did you know, if we can do that, how much, for, how much more can we put our entire life into the hands of the living God who never fails us and trust his word? Come on. How much more? Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was an awesome experience. I'm done with it, by the way, Ma. I'm not going on the next... I don't know if you got plans for a few years. You, you still want to go again? Okay, well, you can help. No, actually, we enjoyed it. It was, a beautiful, it was a beautiful experience. But Romans chapter 10, verse 8, God, very powerful scripture. What does it say? That is the, the, the word of God. The word is, is near you. The word that you can put your entire life on, trust in. His promises. The finished work of Christ at the cross, you can hang your entire life and future on that. And it says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, Paul says, that I preach. How close is every Bible promise to you? How close is a miracle to you? How close is what Jesus has purchased for you on the cross? How close is it to you? It's as close as your mouth and your heart. How many of you know I'm reading you the Bible? This is how near. Drop down, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. For with the heart, notice, or your spirit, one believes God. You don't believe God with your head, with your body. You believe God with your spirit, your heart. That's where your faith is at. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Are you kidding me right now? You mean the worst sinner in the world at a moment can say, Lord, I acknowledge you. You died on the cross for my sins and the mess of my life, and I just want you to know right now, I believe in my heart that you died and were raised from the dead, and I confess you with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and the greatest miracle of salvation will come to that man by two things, confession and belief. Wow. And did you know that every other Bible promise comes the same way? If you receive the greatest miracle, your salvation, that way, then that's the way faith works for every other Bible. Am I right, Pastor Mark? That's why I tell people, please, like the scripture says, put a watch over, over your mouth. Please only speak words that agree with what God says about you and what Jesus has done. Don't be saying one thing and then over here, then you're, you're double-tongued, the scripture says. And you're not gonna, you can't expect to receive much from God. But when you let your heart and what you believe and your words agree with what God says, good things are happening. Now, I've got a few more verses. Can you stay with me? Hebrews chapter 13. I want to just give you a few promises. Notice God says in his word, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have, for he himself has said, what? I will never, read that last part with me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Over the years, you know, we've had people come to us, Pastor Fred, yes. 
can you pray for me? Yes, what about? I just feel like, you know, I've been a Christian for many years, but I just feel like, like God's not with me anymore. I just don't feel like he's helping me anymore. And, and I'm, I'm like, let's turn to the Bible. Let's look at the scripture. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Dear brother, dear sister, I'm saying, do you understand that? I understand you feel that way, but you can't trust your feelings or your emotions. They're in this sense realm. That's natural human faith. But you can trust the ever-living seed of God's word that never changes, and after you're through with your problem, this promise will still be there. And I say, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He loves you. So regardless if you feel forsaken, you are not forsaken. And then I say, have them say that with me. I will never, God says, he will never leave me nor forsake me. Drop down to the next verse. As it goes on to say, so that we may boldly what? Say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Well, this person and that person's coming against me. And this person, let's, let's go back to the Bible. God never leaves you. He never forsakes you, right? He is your helper, we, we make the declaration, and then we believe in our heart, <clears throat> and that puts the power of God to work in our lives. Can you say that after me? Just say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. That, you me, that you never leave me, you never forsake me, that I might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Praise God. Believe that. Doubt your doubts and believe in that. Say that, declare that. And every time you're declaring that and every time you're believing that, you're causing the power of God to work in your life and to bring you out. Aren't you so glad for his promises today? Luke 10, 19, Jesus makes a powerful statement. He says, behold, I give you authority, Jesus said, to trample upon serpents and scorpions, that represents the enemy, all the work of the devil, all the evil. And over all the power of the enemy, Jesus says, I give you authority. And then he makes an astonishing statement. And nothing, everyone say nothing. Nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Whew. Dare to believe that. Dare to say that. You say, this is coming against me, and that's coming against me. I, I understand that, but we're people of faith. We don't have to see it before we believe it. And so we rise up and say, I thank you, Lord. Every evil that shows up, I rebuke by the power of Jesus' name and his authority. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. Praise God. Somebody say, well, it seems like nothing's happened. I understand that. If, if you have the answer that you're trusting God for, you don't need faith. Faith is when things aren't exactly just right. I preached a message some years ago called nothing, 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 bam. Anybody here when I preach that message? <laughs> and it's like people like Abraham and Sarah trusting God for the child. Years and years. Nothing, 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 nothing. One day, bam, there's that promise fulfilled. You might be in the nothing, nothing, nothing season right now, but you keep declaring the promises of God and you hold fast and you will not relent. And all of a sudden, you're going to wake up one day and bam, that child is restored. Bam, that healing is manifest. Bam, every need met in abundance. But will we hold fast when everything's not necessarily right? Well, yes, we can because the word of God is so. Believe that. Declare that. Isaiah 54, 17, it's like a sister scripture. Isaiah 54, it's a prophetic word concerning our Lord Jesus Christ because when you read 53, it's the promise chapter of the coming Messiah. 54 is the windfall of that. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Believe that. Say that. It didn't say the weapons would not be formed, but it said they cannot prosper. As long as you were in this world, stuff's going to happen. But we can say no weapon formed against... Say that with me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Say, I believe that. Yes. 
Though they form, they cannot prosper and they cannot prevail. Every tongue rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You shall have the victory. God is your vindicator. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Amen. I'm going to close with just another verse. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. I'm just giving you examples of a few promises that you can declare and believe over your life. Notice this, a famous scripture, Proverbs 3, but trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. Not with all your mind or your mental faculties, no. With your heart or with your spirit. God says you can trust him. You have a truster on the inside of you, right? You can trust him. Trust him with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. That's one of my favorite scriptures. How about you? That we can trust God. Notice it says, don't lean to your own understandings or always to the mental realm. God gave us a mind. Thank God we, we need to use it. When, I, when I'm driving and I come to a red light, I don't need to say, Lord, should I stop at this? Just give me your will right now. Just, Lord, I... I need, I need your help. What should I do? Should I, what's your will in this situation? No, you don't need that. You've got a mind. You've got your understanding. Stop. It's a red light. Right? So we have that mental, and we use that, and thank God for it. But there are some things concerning your life or your future or the plans and destinies of your life that you cannot lean to your own understanding. You acknowledge him, and he directs your paths. Believe that. Declare that. And in your goings about, you say, thank you, Lord, that you direct all of my paths. I look to you. That's my declaration of faith. Not, oh, I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. God, it's just everything. Everything's a mess. No, 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 no. I thank you, Lord. Even though I don't maybe see everything clear now, I thank you that you direct my steps. You direct my future. You give me wisdom of what to do, where to go. Father, I thank you for that. I look to you. I trust in you. Don't lean to my own reasoning. Sometimes my emotions, they can betray me or I'm my own reasoning, but I look to my heart where you lead me and guide me, and I thank you. The Lord is my helper. He directs me. He guides my steps. Every Bible promise you receive the same way. That's the life of faith, and it's a beautiful life. Do you receive the word of God today, church? Somebody give the Lord praise. Thank you for it, Father. We give you praise for your precious, holy written word. And Father, I thank you for everyone in the house today, those of you watching this morning online, Facebook or YouTube. You're in the house, you're watching. You've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. We gave you the scripture earlier that if you simply believe in your heart that he died for you, that he, God raised him from the dead, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the miracle of salvation will come upon you and your sins will be forgiven, and God will make a new person on the inside of you. The Bible says, just quickly, Roxanne, can you put that last scripture up from Romans 10? The scripture says, whoever believes on him, that is on Jesus, will not be put to shame. When you trust Jesus, God removes all the shame out of your life, all the guilt out of your life, all the condemnation out of your life, all the burdens that you bear, he removes them from your life and it takes everything away of the enemy and puts new life in you and says that you are the, in his favor. You are righteous before him by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed here today, those of you watching, if you need Jesus as the Lord of your life, you feel that little tug in your heart, that's the Lord saying he loves you. He sent Jesus. But you need to say the yes. You need to acknowledge him. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Fred, I just need to recommit my life to the Lord. I've been doing my own thing, going my own way. I want a fresh start. I, want a new, I, I need a new beginning in my life. And I want to start following the way of God. If that's you, you need Jesus as your Lord. Or you say, I want to rededicate my heart and my life. I want a fresh start a new beginning. I want to live a life of faith. If that's you, just lift up your hand very boldly, right where you're, right where you're seated, just with an uplifted hand. 
Pastor Fred, pray for me. I need Jesus in my life. Or I need a, a fresh start. I want to rededicate my heart. Thank you. Thank you for your hand. I want to rededicate my heart and my life. Anyone else that joins, say, include me in this prayer. I need Jesus. It's not too late. I need to rededicate my life and live a life of faith. Anyone else? I'm going to look around one more time. All right. Thank you. Those of you watching, pray this simple prayer. You in the house, let's help them. Say this after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. I make Jesus Christ both Lord and Savior of my life. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for a fresh start, a new beginning in my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give a round of applause? Come on to all those that called on the Lord today. I tell you, that's exciting. Thank you for making that decision for the Lord. And we just encourage people, please come back to church. I tell folks, come back to church. Just come for one year. Like you, like you go to work every day, come to church every Sunday, whenever you can, and watch the word of God and the power of the gospel transform your life and your future. So, And when you come back, please bring others, family members or friends. They need Jesus too. They need a touch of God in their heart. Invite them as well. We believe God's going to minister to them. Amen. Did you all receive that word this morning? I hope you did. I'm going to speak this blessing over everyone here in the house and those within the sound of my voice. If you'd like, you can lift your hands. As your pastor, I speak this blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep, protect you and your loved ones throughout this week. And may God give his angels charge concerning you according to Psalm 91, that his angels dwell with you and protect and prosper your way. I declare that no evil, plague, disaster, calamity comes near your dwelling. And may God place you at the right place at the right time with the right people. And may the spirit of faith boldly come upon each and every one of you in Jesus' name. And finally, may his shalom, peace, and rest be your constant companion throughout this week in Jesus' name. Say amen if you receive that. All right, God bless you. We love you. You are dismissed.